Fantastic. Welcome to XL Catlin Coral Live. We're here in Bermuda, and I'm delighted to have Dr. Samantha de Putron here with me at the Bermuda Institute of Ocean Science. We're here to uh, introduce you to the wonders of the reef in Bermuda, and also to answer any questions you may have um, about the coral reef uh, and the ecosystem in general. Samantha, thank you so much uh, for joining us. How, how, how did you get involved in researching coral for a living? Yes, well, originally I'm from Guernsey in the Channel Islands, which is um, a small island basically in the English Channel. And it's got amazing marine life, but the marine life, uh, is, it's in cold water. So swimming there, sometimes you have to put big, thick wetsuits on. But when I went to university, which was in Swansea in South Wales, I uh, had an opportunity to come here actually to Bermuda for an undergraduate internship and to be honest I was offered that and staying in Swansea and obviously the idea of coming to Bermuda and a subtropical island I just thought I want to go swimming and see marine animals in the warm and when I was here um, I fell in love with coral reefs and so from then on I've studied coral reefs uh, for the rest of my career basically. Amazing. Yeah. And, and you say fell in love with coral reefs. What, what makes coral reefs so special for you? So I think as, a, as an undergraduate intern, swimming on the coral reefs here, I was just amazed. It was my first time scuba diving and I felt you feel like you're flying over a rainforest. There's just so much to see, there's so many interactions going on, you've just got a myriad of animals, um, vertebrates and vertebrates just all interacting together and it's just the colour and the vibrance. And with that, it just made me want to understand more. I wanted to know why these corals are living here. I wanted to know how they are functioning. I wanted to know everything about them. And I wanted to know how well they're going to survive. Because then I started to understand some of the perils to coral reefs. And I just wanted to know if there's what I can do and I can research can help them survive into the future. Amazing. I'm just going to put up a, a, a map of, of where we are in the ocean there's this sort of small white dot in the middle of the atlantic we're not in typical coral reef <laughs> country no. as it were so how come we, we, we've got these you know we're talking about understanding the reefs how come we've got reefs in, and coral in the bermuda mm -hmm. yeah so what you can see here on this map is that the red is the warmer waters and a lot of the warmer waters are down here and you can see that in the in the caribbean but you can see this arm coming up across the eastern coast of the states. And that sort of arm or big body of water, that's the Gulf Stream. And the Gulf Stream warm body of water is bringing the right type of water temperatures up to Bermuda. It's like we like to think of it as a big arm that's engulfing Bermuda and keeping us warm enough for the temperatures. So the interesting thing about Bermuda is that it's the, one of the most uh, northerly coral reefs in the world which actually makes it very fascinating to study because if you then know why a coral is living up in this most northern environment, you can start to learn why the environment is, how the environment is acting on the coral. So you've got your greatest temperature range here. So you've got corals that are very resilient or adapted to those high temperature ranges. And so that makes them very interesting because it actually can get cold here in the winter. We do wear quite a lot of wetsuits in the winter here. <laughs> and you've got some examples of, of, of the, the, the coral, um, of corals from, from, from the waters around Bermuda. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. it's amazing. And just, just so for, for the, those of our viewers who, who might not know what coral is, this sort of animal, vegetable, mineral conundrum. Right, right. <laughs> what, what is coral? Right, well, so this is a coral skeleton, and um, if you can see that, it looks, I'm sure a lot of you will recognize that, it, it's a brain coral. Um, and this is the skeleton, and underneath this brain coral looks very much like a rock, and you can see part of the coral has been growing over the side of the rock here as it grows outwards. So this coral would have started very small as just one little part of the coral, which is called a polyp, which would be living right down probably in the middle of this, what's now called a colony. And that polyp looks just like an anemone. And so it would have a central mouth and a ring of tentacles. Uh, and then it will grow this a skeleton on the underside, which is an exoskeleton. And this is limestone or calcium carbonate. And that coral, as it gets bigger, it will bud, just like anemones will, which means it's replicating itself or it's splitting itself into two. And it grows and it forms this colony. So 
And all the time, it's growing this skeleton underneath it. And corals are always growing upwards and outwards. They're always putting down a little bit of skeleton underneath every day. So they sort of sit in a little skeletal cup, if you like. And the little anemone sits on the top. And so the, the polyps all bud, and they expand outwards and upwards. And actually, this really is still a baby. So these guys get huge. So they can get over a meter big. And sometimes we measure them and we feel like we're giving them a big hug when we're trying to measure the size of them because they get really, really tall and big. Um, so yeah, this is what's, what's called our stony corals or our hard corals. So it's a hard calcium carbonate skeleton. And there's one question that came through um, just now was, was you talked about budding. Is, is that the only way that corals reproduce? No, no, good, great, great question. Um, corals also reproduce by something called fragmentation, um, and that's more common in um, these guys here. And so these guys will often break off, and so uh, and often you can see parts of necrosis down the bottom, which is causing them to break, and then they can move what, around as well. What would you necrosis a technical term for? Oh, so so sort of like the tissue dying off a little bit at the bottom here. And, uh, but both of those budding and fragmentation. Those, those are both asexual replication, right? So they are sort of cloning themselves. Uh, corals also will reproduce by sexual reproduction, right? And that's when they're forming um, gametes, right? Eggs are, are released into the water and they produce um, larvae. And then those will have a dispersive state in the water column and then they'll settle. Um, coral larvae are about anywhere from like they're basically about half a millimeter in size, okay. right? So if you look at um, pinhead, type yeah, pinhead type territory, yeah. So they're tiny, really, really tiny. And it's amazing to think that this could have started from something that was a pinhead size, but it would have settled and then grown. Amazing. I mean, because just, just looking at this, I mean, a satellite photograph and that, that we're talking about pinhead yeah. creatures or, you know, lava making up structures that you can see yeah. from, from satellite. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and can you just, just sort of on, on, on this map, just tell us a little bit about the nature of Bermuda's mm -hmm. reefs? Yeah, well, I always say to people when they come to Bermuda and visit us, I say, you have to go, you have to go snorkeling, because most of Bermuda is actually underwater. So, I stand up or just yeah. so, okay. so what you can see here. Oh, move, 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 move out of the way. Okay. So this is the island of Bermuda here, this fish hook shape. Um, but most of Bermuda is underwater, because if you can see the lighter color that's all the way around here, this is the platform, what we call our Bermuda pedestal, or our platform. And the, the, this is all coral reefs. And so this, this, this area here is quite small in regards to all of the rest of this, which is our Bermuda pedestal, or coral reef platform. We've got different types of reefs. Right on the outer ridge, edge here is what's called our rim reef platform, and that surrounds the whole of the top of the pedestal. Um, and that's protecting what we call our North Lagoon, which is this inner lagoonal area here. And in within this North Lagoon here, there's also lots of coral reefs, but they tend to be quite patchy, so we call them patch reefs, because there's just like aggregations of reef. Whereas around the edge here, we have a lot of reef structure forming almost like a big um, barrier around the island. What you can't see from this picture is that if you extend past the light color, out a couple of kilometers mostly, what you'll see is a deeper reef as well, um, our terrace reef and right down to what's called the mesophotic reef. So corals are even extending further out than this. And so as you, as you can see, Bermuda basically most of it is underwater. <laughs> Amazing. And and with just one question came through, uh, maybe in reference to, to the fragmentation, and, and this was connected to, can, 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 we, can we sort of grow corals in a nursery that's going to plant, plant them yes. out again on the reef. Yes, yes, and there's actually been great work that's being done. There's been a lot of conservation work that's being done now, which is being doing exactly that. And so you can take corals, and this is being done especially for um, the elkhorn coral and the staghorn coral. Their proper names are Cropera. And that's the Caribbean. It's the Caribbean, yeah. It's a, it's a coral in the Caribbean that's been um, quite badly damaged, mostly through some diseases, and it gets wiped out in some hurricanes. Um, and the, a lot of the nurseries have been concentrating on those corals and other coral species, but those because they are actually endangered. So we do need to look at cons conserving those and, and putting an active management to them. Uh, the idea of that is fragmentation is you can take a healthy coral and you can break off pieces nice and carefully and you can nurture them and you can grow them and look after them until they then get bigger and then you can repopulate them onto the reefs. 
there's also a really exciting other aspect of, of that, which is you can actually start growing corals which are more resilient. So resilient means that you are able to withstand a stress better. So for example, you could be, or you can bounce back from a, a disturbance. So an example would be um, increasing water temperatures. And some corals can be quite susceptible to that. That can cause them to get very stressed. Other corals um, of the same species may be more resilient through lots of different mechanisms. And so if you can find, say, say this one is what we would call a super coral. We say this guy doesn't care about increased sea water temperatures to an extent. Then let's fragment this and let's replicate it, right? Let's clone this one because this one's going to do better than, say, mm -hmm. another coral. Which might not do so well. And and you talked about um, stress being caused by an increase in in, in sea temperatures, and and I think many of our viewers may have come, come across the term coral bleaching. Mm -hmm. it, what what is coral bleaching, and and it, does that mean a coral reef is dying, or we talked about things bouncing back? Yeah, absolutely. I don't know if you wanted to go back to the picture of the corals, and I can see um if you most of the, the pictures that you guys uh, so most of the colours that you can see here. Um, so there's quite a bit of, can you yeah, zoom in on Oh, there's the brain coral. Okay, good. So, um, oh, no, oh, oh, we'll find a different place instead. Let's get some. There's lots of brain corals, thankfully, in Bermuda. So I showed you the skeleton of the brain coral here. So um, over here, you can see these are the live brain corals. And so the coloration, the colors of them that you're looking at are yellowy browny color. And a lot of the color that you see on the reef there is sort of a yellowy browny color. There's definitely some purple especially in some of the soft corals. Um, but mostly the color that you're seeing in the coral animals themselves is actually the color of a plant, a little plant cell or an algae. Um, and this algae, um, it's sort of posh name if you like, it's a dinoflagellate, but it's basically a little sort of singular cell, or there was many cells, but it's a, basically a little dinoflagellate, it's basically a little algal cell, cells. Um, so they have chloroplasts, which means they photosynthesize. Uh, and they're microscopic, um, they're like, a few microns big, and if you look at a, a, a dime, a dime is a millimeter, so that's a thousand microns, right? Oh, so wow. if you cut that up a thousand times, that would be the size of so these. So typical sort of dime or tempe coin, or mm -hmm. the, the, yeah, the, yeah, on the side of it, it's a millimeter. Okay. So uh, um, one micron is a thousandth of a millimeter. So you cut it up a thousand times, and then stick eight or twelve of those together. That's the size of, of these little dinoflagellates or these little algal or plant wow. cells. And so they are, these microscopic um, plants, they basically live inside of the coral tissue. So the coral tissue is a, a thin layer on top of this coral, and the, the little um, dinoflagellates live inside of that. Um, so it's called an endosymbiont, endo inside, and it's okay. a very important symbiosis. Um, and that's what gives the, the, a lot of corals their color, because mostly corals um, tissue is quite boring, really. It doesn't really have any color in it. it has, some corals have pigments, but many others don't. So the term coral bleaching is when that symbiosis breaks down. So what that means is that the dinoflagellates will break away from the symbiosis, or they get pushed out from, by the coral. Mm -hmm. and so they're no longer inside of the tissue. So the coral looks white because you're looking straight through that clear uh, tissue to the white skeleton. To the skeleton. Oh, yeah. wow. And so then it looks very, very white and, and very bright. Um, and if they, if that symbiosis it breaks down for a long period of time, um, that can cause a lot of stress to that coral. And so what we're talking about is, is that the, the coral polyp, the animal, is getting a lot of its energy mm -hmm. from, from the algae. It's almost like having your sort of vegetable sort of in, in, inside right. your body and getting that energy yep. as a product of photosynthesis. That's right. So getting a lot of sugars um, and there's other aspects as well. And there's a lot of recycling that goes on between the animal and, and the plant itself. But yes, just like trees and grass, these little plants are photosynthesizing and they're giving most of that food to the coral. So I like to think of the coral as being like a farmer and it's got all of its little um, dinoflagellates, all its little plant cells that it's mostly, most of the time sort of looking after and then taking a lot of the sugars and taking a lot of the crop. And then that, that relationship breaks down when we get these warmer temperatures. And do, yes. And, and can do it. And, and that lasting for a long time could, could lead to a coral mortality if, if, if that's... Can do, yes. And a lot of that seems to depend a lot on the species of coral and also where you are. And so this then brings us back to the resilience. Some corals are more resilient and that symbiosis sometimes, that relationship between the plant and the, the animal, the coral polyp and the plant, 
uh, in some instances, it's more resilient. So you can increase the temperature a little yeah. bit more and it wouldn't necessarily break down. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, and so if we've got this uh, next question, if, if parrotfish eat coral, are they bad for coral reefs? Oh, good question. So largely the parrotfish uh, are not always going at the coral. So what parrotfish really want to be eating is algae. They want to be eating the actual sort of macro algae and turf, turf algae that you can see on, on the reef. And so there's lots of instances here that there's sort of this sort of fuzzy stuff that you can see. And that's all macro algae or turf algae, which is just smaller types of algae growing on the reef. And so that's the main diet of the parrotfish. And that's what they're trying to get at. A lot of the time when they go for the algae, they're also scraping the tops of the coral. So they can, you can see scrape marks on the corals. And also sometimes um, some parrotfish will, will nibble off the tops of branching corals as well. Um, but a lot of the time they're mostly just going in between all the coral heads and grazing on that macro algae. And they are absolutely vital for keeping the macro algae down like they like grazers they're like lawn mowers over the reef and without that the macro algae if you just just like if you didn't mow your lawn every every now like for, for a long period of time that algae could grow over and macro algae especially can grow a lot faster than these corals can grow so we need the parrotfish on the reef we need them healthy and we need them grazing around the corals you are right every now and then they do scrape parts of the corals, but uh, they're also very important by taking the algae. And, and taking the algae away leaves space for the coral to grow, mm -hmm. um, and, and also leaves space for coral settlement. That's that right, for the larvae. Yeah, those little microscopic larvae or tiny larvae we were talking about, they also need space, um, and they will rapidly get overgrown as well by the macro algae. So, we need our parrotfish to keep that algae. Keep away the slimy seaweed so, so yeah. we have, have the have, have the reef or, or the balance. Right, absolutely. And there's lots of there's lots of ways that uh, some reefs have been turning into, it's called a phase shift. It's when you have a coral dominated, so an area which is covered in corals, which will then shift to an area which is more dominated in algae, in macroalgae. And that that shift from from having lots of corals to not so many corals and lots of algae. It's unfortunately been quite common in some areas, and it could be due to factors such as overfishing and, and loss of the parrotfish. Also, factors such as increasing uh, nutrients, which is food for algae, and that can mean that the algae can grow a lot quicker as well. Um, yeah. So, Great. Questions. Wow. Um, how big is the biggest coral reef in the world? Oh, great question. That would be the Great Barrier Reef. Um, Gosh, I'd have to look up exactly how big it is. It's basically the, all the way. Kilometers. Is it 1,600 That's as much as that? It's all the way down the coast of of, <laughs> of Australia. Yeah, it's it's pretty we'll, huge. We'll, we'll, we'll get, we can get the. I mean, but I, I find it. Um, we've got, we've got got that sort of picture of Bermuda there. But mm -hmm. amazing that. I mean, it, people say that the Great Barrier Reef is the only living structure you can see from space. space yeah. I think our satellites have got better now. Our we satellites have got better. We can, can see, see more we, now. We can yeah. see much more. But, but with the naked eye, if you're in if you're in the space station or in orbit, you can actually right. see the. You can. Yes, you can. You can actually see it, and it, it, it's a very impressive structure. Yeah, and it's almost like it's, in some areas, it's like a double barrier. So you you've got so much reef structure; it just goes on and on and on and on. Um, very incredible to see. And and then well, the biggest coral structure. I mean, we we talked about putting your arms around. You know, oh yes, the oh, they here. get bigger. They get bigger than that. So some of the corals in the Pacific, I mean, they're huge. They're as bigger, big, bigger than this room, it seems, or as big as or as tall as this ceiling up here. They can get very, very big. Some of these old coral colonies, and, and hundreds, old, of hundreds of years hundreds old, hundreds of years old, hundreds of years old. Yeah. So they've done some work where they can take. You can age a coral by taking a core from the coral. So if I wanted to age this coral, I could uh, take a core, especially as it's skeleton. So yeah. um, and Basically, if you take a drill and you take a, a core through here all the way down and pull it out very carefully, what you would see is it's just like aging a, a, a tree. You can actually see the rings of the growth. So you can see what's called the annual bands, okay. just like a tree. And that shows you how and you can count them. And it will show you how old um, that coral is. And it will give you information about its growth rate and its past histories, just okay. like trees. Thank you. And you've, you've got some... 
we've got one question coming through, but I could see some other samples in 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 your box here. I, I mean, this is it's soft soft corals. Let me see if I can help with getting uh, all, all tangled up. All tangled I just up. to get this one out here. Yeah, again, a lot of you might recognize this. I'm sorry if it's a bit faint. And it's again, it's but just the skeleton. Amazing, sort of, as you turn out to see that sort of. Yeah. yeah. So, um, obviously, this is a sea fan. <laughs> so, that's what it looks like. Uh, and so, again, you should have someone here. Most of those are sea rods. So, mostly what you can see on the screen are the sea rods. Here's we'll the skeleton of the sea go, rod. Go around the um, reef go and around see. The reef a you can see a sea fan somewhere. Mm, a lot of sea rods out here. This is on the rim reef where it's dom dominated by sea rods, but there should be some sea fans too. Would this be a sea fan? Oh, yeah, there it is, yeah. So hiding. Hiding, yes. So, <laughs> so here's a sea rod. There's a bunch of algae that we're talking about. There's some rain corals. There's the sea rod and there's the sea fan hiding behind it. They get, they're quite short and, and bushy out on what's called our rim reef because it's quite a lot of wave action out there on the rim reef. Um, but this is what's called a, a, oh, some lovely big brain corals there in that picture. Um, this is called a soft coral because it's just, as you can see, I can bend it and I can, I can move it. So very different to this hard coral here, which is pretty heavy actually. This is a sort of big load of limestone. Um, these soft corals here, and there's several different types, and you, you can see, again, it looks a bit like, and people think that they're trees, because it does look a bit like a tree or a bush, and you can see all these big branches. This is actually made up of protein, um, and this protein here, uh, and then there's thinner branches, and then the tissue, again, would be all around this, coating and covering it. So again, this would be made up of hundreds and hundreds of little coral polyps, and remember the polyp is just like an anemone, so it's got a central mouth and a ring of tentacles. So when this was alive, it was covered in tissue, um, as you can see from these pictures. And also, this is then the sea rods. So these are the sea rods, which is mostly what you can see, all of these branching corals here. These are all of the sea rods. Um, and again, same, same, same structure. This is soft. This is the protein rod structure. And we can see some of the tissue here. It's dried out now, but this is some of the tissue um, which you can see attached uh, over here as well again and then i don't know i don't know if you can see that but there's lots of little holes and each of these holes would be where that little coral polyp would sit the central mouth and the ring of tentacles and this would be its base anchoring it down onto the reef and it would move in the wave actions and 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 the 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 fact that we there are more soft corals here is that is that adaptation to do with those strong currents coming through or Yes, yeah, if you look at um, coverage of the reef, um, we normally have more brain corals than we do the actual soft corals, but because they're, they're standing upright, they actually look like there is more structure of okay. them. Um, and they're very, very important here in Bermuda, especially and, and elsewhere, and they give us the 3D structure. So in Bermuda, we don't have really large branching corals, those elkhorn or staghorn corals, which are the acroporas that I was telling you about. Uh, we don't have those in Bermuda, they've never been here. We think we're too far north. Um, to have those up here. So that, because we don't have them, we don't have um, a lot of structure necessarily that's created by our corals. Like right? we have long-term structures of so the big reefs and cells, more, but more on, on a, just looking on this sort of scale. So our soft corals are very dominant and they give us a lot of, of structure as do what's called the fire coral, which is, I don't know if you can see any of that. Um, we'll have to the corners, I can't see any right now here. Anyway. Um, but yes, they are dominant, and they do they do like to grow in areas of uh, high high water flow, uh, and we do get a lot of, of wave action out here on the rim reef, and that water flow is bringing them um, the right amount of nutrients and food. Not not so that we've noticed. Uh, I can see I can see some. It's all quite small, so it's this uh -huh. here, these here. There's the other sort of shorter branching corals. Uh, and down here. Um, great. Um, so uh, we've got some questions about to come through from Portugal. I hope. Um, thank you very much. Um, but can you put cameras on fish to study the coral reef, or how would you use technology to improve mm -hmm. our understanding of, of of the reef? Yeah, absolutely. So we. I don't believe they put cameras actually on the fish um, themselves, but there are many times that you would, would anchor cameras onto the reef. 
because yeah. um, the fish, a lot of the reef fish are fairly small, um, and I don't know the technology of putting cameras actually on the fish themselves, but you can, you can um, we often leave cameras out on the reef, and we will record a section of the reef for a period of time, and then you can calculate your fish abundances uh, on the reef itself. We also use cameras to video the same sections of reef um, year after year, and sometimes three times a year, um, and that'll allow us to document the cover of the different types of coral species and then look at change. And we can also use those videos to show us differences in um, coral color, which give us an idea of, say, the bleaching events. Um, but yes, we do, we do study uh, the reefs a lot using video techniques. And a lot of the time as well, we're also we're out there, we're scuba diving with our underwater paper. People always say to me, how do you work underwater? I say, well, we've actually got paper, which you take underwater. It looks quite different to regular paper. You, it's very difficult to tear and break. And we take that down. Sometimes we take our underwater notebooks and we've got our pencils and we're scuba diving on the reef and we're writing all of our notes. And so you can get a lot of information from videos, but we also send divers down to do all the assessment surveys as well. Amazing. Um, so, uh, Cracky, why are coral reefs so important? Gosh, that's a good question as well. There's some great questions coming through. Yeah, like, uh, where do I start? So um, basically what we're standing on right now here in Bermuda, this, this is coral reef. <laughs> so these, Bermuda has been built up by the corals. Um, and there's a lot of other processes that have happened as well. But the, the corals really are forming the basis of this island. And so, uh, and the picture that we had up earlier, um, I think we'll bring to it back that, yeah. to that, uh, of Bermuda. So. So a lot of this, this platform here has been built up by these reefs, and so that shows you the importance of, of the coral reefs, but also right now it's protecting. So it's protecting our shoreline, especially down here on the south shore here, when we get general daily wave action, but also if we get any storms coming in, the, the ocean is always trying to break down the land, right, and the erosion. Um, and every time there's a storm, we do see parts of the land which are starting to sort of break away, and there's some damage that occurs along the beaches here. But mostly, the, the waves break over our reefs. And so there's lots of reefs around here, which are basically just like literally acting like a barrier and, and stopping that, that, the, the wave action and protecting the reefs. So coral reefs are very important from, from that, that point of view. Um, coral reefs are like tropical rainforests um, in the sea. So they house an amazing amount of diversity, huge number of other invertebrates and animals, invertebrates and plants, all live in the coral reef. We always say that everybody wants to live in the coral reef, it's the best place to live. Um, and so we have this huge biodiversity. So the corals are, are creating a home. So we call it like a foundational animal. It, it, it's, it's on the, it creates the reef, which creates a home for everything else. Uh, what do we get from that biodiversity? So we could look at it from um, medicinal purposes or biotechnologies, for example. So there may be a dollar values from mm -hmm. that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and obviously, right, straight coming back to food. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so food's one of the main ones. So fishermen, if you think about fishermen, there's a lot of fishermen who are catching uh, all of their fish from, from the reefs themselves. Yeah. I mean, for some of the old, older students, I mean, we, we have this term ecosystem goods and services, mm -hmm. which is one of the ways that we've started to put, as you're saying, a dollar value right. on our habitats. Maybe whether we agree with putting dollar value on nature or not, right. it's, it's a way that we understand its benefit to mm -hmm. humans. And we've, we've mentioned some of those. Words. I think someone's saying that the reef is worth over $700 million dollars. Yeah. Just, just a year, just in, in Bermuda. Just in Bermuda. And it was quite hard to sort of come up with that value. And they did a lot of surveys and they did a lot of research to come up with that value. And, you know, I look at that and I think, I think maybe it's worth even more. And, you know, it is very hard to put that dollar value on it. But if it's easier for people to understand it like that, then that's a lot of money. Right. And so you can think of it along those. I think it's worth even more than that. I think they're priceless. <laughs> yeah. It's in prices. I mean, I mean the, the global value was something like $1 trillion. Was yeah. Was it as much as yeah. that? Yeah. That sounds about Right. <laughs> that's, that's about right. Yeah, so we, we need to put a lot of effort and energy into more research and more conservation. Brilliant. We've got um, uh, a, a question here. We talked a little bit about um, aging um, coral, mm -hmm. um, but is there a way that we can age reef systems? This is on the Great Barrier Reef, but perhaps in Bermuda we can, can we work out the age of, of a reef? 
Yeah, so, so doing it's the same sort of idea for looking at aging of, of reefs in general is that you, you can take cores. You can take cores and get yeah. Yeah, cores down the sediment and look at the rocks. So that's move, moving more to geology rather yeah. than coral reef science, but I understand you can certainly do that, yeah. Okay, brilliant. Um, and this one, we've, we've, we've talked a little bit about bleaching and some other sort of um, impacts on the reef. What, what could a sort of a, a six to nine year old do to, to help you know, mm. conserve reefs for future generations? Yeah, no, I think that that's also a great question. We get asked it a lot, and, and I always say that if, if you if you live anywhere near a coral reef, I always say look after your own backyard. There's so much you can do in an area. Um, if you don't live near a coral reef, then there's so much you can learn about them, and it is all about education and understanding, and we can all keep the oceans clean. Uh, keeping the oceans clean will help keep the reefs clean because the, the water, as I'm sure a lot of you know, it's all big gyres and a lot of the time it ends up in the middle of the gyres and especially places like Bermuda. Um, so if, if, our, if our oceans are dirty uh, from the start, that's going to impact ocean, that's going to impact a lot of the oceans worldwide. Um, so, you know, ways to keep the oceans clean, um, we've heard a lot about plastics, it's been in the news a lot, um, everybody can reduce the plastics that they're using, right? everybody can reduce waste, and so that helps. And, and coral reefs seem to be suffering from an uh, increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide as well, mm -hmm. so is that something that, you know, wherever you are? Absolutely, yeah, it's, it's definitely moving to, to cleaner living um, and trying to reduce emissions, so again, everybody can do their part with that, um, and so, uh, yeah, reducing emissions will certainly help, and, and the the change in the carbon dioxide levels that we're seeing now, even if we all stop driving our cars and everything to, to, uh, today, there's still going to be a lag effect. So we're still going to see an effect over the next 50 years or so on the oceans, and so it's vital that we study that and we understand it uh, further so we can predict what's going to happen uh, and understand the changes. I mean, one of the things that I've struggled with in, in, the, in the global conversations about, for instance, carbon dioxide and anticipated temperature changes is that uh, keeping to a limit of two degrees might, might mean that a lot of coral reefs don't, don't survive in, into the future, that mm -hmm. maybe a, a 1.5 degree rise would, would be, would be yes. the minimum we needed. Yeah. Is, is, is that what we could be looking at? That is true. We could be looking at that. It's, um and it doesn't seem like very much, you know, one to two degrees yeah. Celsius. It sounds, it sounds it like a really tiny... It, it doesn't seem like much, but it's, it, it is a lot, because this is what you're talking about there, the sort of average uh, temperatures, and then most importantly, the upper temperature range. Um, and what we've been seeing recently, unfortunately, is a lot of coral bleaching events uh, over successive years, because we seem to be creeping above what's called the thermal threshold, or that area where you can see resilience still in some of these reefs. Um, and so... If reefs are pretty much living at their upper thermal limit anyway, so increasing them that temperature by a little bit can be can be devastating. So, yeah. and and we we've got um, we started off talking about your study of resilience. Mm -hmm. um, has your research given you hope that we we, we can do something to, to help reefs in, in, into the future? And one, I'm referencing the question here, saying what what's the focus? Of your research, oh, okay. Element. Yeah, no, good. So, so in my research, so I, I, I've got a lot of different hats, and and I'm very interested in what's called ecophysiology. And so, basically, we're, what we're looking at is the ecology, which is how the environment is affecting the biology or affecting the corals and how they function and um, and, and what they do sort of on a daily basis. So that's all of their physiology is how they work and how they yeah. function. Uh, so my research is looking at that and looking at stressors to a coral reef. So I want to know, for example, if I increase the temperature to some corals, how does that change their, how they function? How does it change their physiology? So, for example, their respiration rate, like how much they're breathing, uh, uh, their photosynthesis, how does it change the um, algae? Uh, corals actually have a lot of bacteria living on and in, in them, just like most animals do, like we do, um, and that's called the microbiome, and I'm very interested as to how temperature will change that as well, and how the, the, all the bacteria living on the coral, whether they're good or bad for the coral, and it's a mixture. So I'm interested in that as well. And I um, mean, do you, do you study that using sort of tanks where you, you, you recreate a sort of a mini reef and, and, and give it different 
yeah. conditions? We do, we do both actually. We, we try and uh, do a lot of studies where we are studying the corals on the reef, okay. like in situ. Yep. Um, and we're also studying the corals there in the aquaria. So Bermuda is a fascinating place to study because we call it our natural laboratory. Um, from close to land here, right out to the outer reef, we have very wide gradients or changes in uh, environmental conditions. So okay. for example, temperature. We have a greater temperature range in these reefs inshore. Uh, narrow, small bodies of water, like when it's shallow, those bodies of water are quick to heat up or cool down. So okay. you can see a wide temperature range on a daily basis, wider temperature range sort of on, on daily basis yeah. and also over the seasons. So basically when you go swimming in Bermuda in the winter, you don't want to go close to shore because it's the coldest right, in the winter. You want to take your boat all the way off shore and it's warmer by a couple of degrees really? because it can get very cold inshore. So, and the same in the summer, it can get warmer inshore and it will stay more moderated um, slightly offshore. So we have these wide temperature gradients and we have the same coral species or same types of coral growing in all these reefs. So what I like to do is I like to draw a big transect not really, so just an imaginary transect across the reef from where we are here and at Biles. Transect is a, is a study line. A study line, sorry, yeah. Up from where we are here, this is the fire station here, so we can take a study line from here, we can take it all the way across, right out to the top of the screen here, there. And we'll study various reefs all the way along that line. Um, and then by doing that, we can start to understand natural variations in temperature and how it affects the, the corals. In addition to that, we will take various little corals from those reef areas and just borrow them for a little bit. We put them back in and we bring them into big tanks and we can modify the temperatures if, if we're looking at temperature, we modify the temperatures or any other of these environmental conditions in those tanks um, and we can directly um, monitor the corals there. And so by putting those two studies together, studies that are in tanks and studies that are actually in the field, that gives you your best scenarios of trying to understand what's actually happening to the reefs. Um, question here, and I'm, I'm not, not quite sure quite what we're getting to, but it, it's, it's we, we have a school who, who based in Portugal on the Atlantic. We bought um, Atlantic corals here. How, how, how are those um, habitats connected, or, or does it matter what, we, what, mm -hmm. what happens in Portugal for, for Atlantic corals? Uh, yeah, so the, the, I mean, the, the, the water, especially across the Atlantic, is definitely connected. So the big ocean gyres will take uh, water. Yeah, there we go. So, yeah, you can sort of, oh, what's that? Portugal looks hot. Oh, yeah. And this is sea surface temperature, I think. Ah, uh -huh, this is sea surface temperature one. So, what you can't see here, this is the surface uh, seawater movements. When you, what you've actually got as well is, is underneath. You've got the big sort of ocean gyres, which are moving at the bottom of the ocean as well. But this is the North Atlantic, right? And this is a big ocean gyre. So I always say that what people are putting in the water down here in the Caribbean will end up in England. And eventually what you're putting in England and Portugal could end up in the water back down here. I mean, especially within the, the big, what's called gyres or the big areas like the North Atlantic, the, the water is certainly um, sort of connected to an extent. <laughs> yeah. And one of the questions we had, we had earlier today um, was talk, so we're talking about the oceans warming. Mm -hmm. Will that mean that we'll one day end up with coral reefs on, on the coast of Portugal and, and perhaps even Guernsey? Oh, step boys, yeah. So, um, yeah, a lot of people have sort of uh, talked about this and, and it's called sort of, um, you know, uh, corals are going to find what's called a refuge and maybe move further north. And, and so this is why we think Bermuda is very important because we've already got resilient corals here. Um, when you actually come to it and you think about the speed that it takes for corals to be able to store reefs themselves to step and to grow far north, it would take a long period of time. Um, and also there's, there's other reasons, um, you know, the wave energies might not be the same in some of these areas and, and it's the, the actual sort of recruitment patterns. Other people say, can we take corals and can we start sort of moving them, you know, now? Uh, again, it's a huge undertaking to think about doing that. And obviously, if you take... A coral, any sort of species that's not supposed to be an ecosystem and you move it to a new ecosystem then it can cause changes which could be problematic as well. And we're, yeah. we're, we're talking a process of how, how of millions of years mm -hmm. of how some sort of corals came from, thousands, the, from, yeah. from, from the coral triangle into the Caribbean and then to Bermuda that was a you know, yeah. hundreds of thousands. Yeah, yeah, of, yeah. 
long, long time. A long, yeah. long time. So if we're talking <laughs> so, about mm-hmm. these thermal yeah. refugia, these, these sort of safe places for potentially a warmer ocean, mm-hmm. then it's... it's <laughs> I think what we what's more likely that we're going to see in the um, it's all about the the rate of change, isn't it? And, and the rapid what well, what we're in now is a period of rapid environmental change, and so that rate of change is too fast, uh, or faster compared to what's happened in evolutionary times or past times. Uh, what's more likely going to happen is that when you look at the the reefs, it's going to be pockets of reefs that are going to be, as I mentioned before, more resilient. So you may see some areas dying out when it's getting too hot, but then because of water motion or movements or latitude, um, you're going to see areas which are going to be surviving. And so you asked me earlier about uh, research and what do I think? And, and yeah. I think that it's going to be a case of winners and losers. Um, and I, and it's going to, that's going to be on a scale of some areas are going to be um, harder hit than other yeah. areas in terms of winners and losers. But it's also going to be differences between species. A lot of my research um, has been showing that the resilience to, say, increasing carbon dioxide um, and um, ocean acidification is actually very much species dependent. So it depends on on the type of coral. Some corals don't seem to mind so much than others. So, you know, and that's fascinating from a scientist's point of view. It's like, why? Why do they not care? <laughs> why do some care? corals not care about ocean acidification and other corals do? Amazing. Um, we're nearing the end of our session today. So. Thank you very much. But before we go, if there are any budding coral scientists, marine scientists out there, mm. age six and onwards, yes. what advice would you give them so they can end up somewhere like Bermuda and enjoying warmer water than perhaps <laughs> if they stayed in Wales? Right, I know. Keep studying hard. <laughs> there are a lot of opportunities now um, when you get, uh, it, it depending, obviously a lot, a lot of it depends where you live, but there's a lot of opportunities to get to say local aquariums um, and do little internships or do classes. So I think just look locally. You'll be surprised at how many sort of even coral related or warmer water related um, activities are going on. I'm really hoping that through sort of activities like this as well, we're bringing this into the classroom so people can learn more. And there's a lot of online curriculum, I believe now for, for coral reef studies. Um, and also when you are moving through to um, uh, Further on in high school, uh, and especially uh, if you go to college and, and undergraduate level, there's a lot of internships again. So um, we and take internships here. And, <laughs> great. and the, the type of subjects that students will be studying, do, do, do they need to look for a marine science undergraduate course? Mm-hmm. Or can, can it be a general science undergraduate course and then they can specialize? Yeah, so again, it, it varies. So I did a marine biology undergraduate degree, um, and then I did a master's degree in rocky shores and temperate ecology. Um, and that was in the coastline of, of Wales, so I did yeah. stay there for a bit. And then I moved on to coral reef ecology um, as a PhD. But in between all of that, I was getting doing a lot of internships and uh, okay. studying in people's labs to get the experience. Um, yeah. So. so a balance of of studying the right topics from even from making sure you're doing sort of biology chemistry mm-hmm. for a level if you're yeah. in the uk or, or majoring in those science subjects biology is the most important one yeah because you can uh, especially in the uk you can pick up um at university the chemistry and the maths um okay but it is uh, i do believe it's getting more competitive as well so <laughs> so internships even, even whilst you're at school try and get in contact with local aquaria or, mm-hmm. or or other institutes and seeing if you can spend a few days or longer there but i think also uh, the the disciplines are, are, are crossed a lot so i i studied a lot marine science a lot in in the uk you know mm-hmm. in in colder waters uh, a lot of what i learned is obviously directly correlated to what i'm doing now i'm just doing it in warmer waters but the backgrounds are all the yeah. same and so if you want to go to your local aquarium wherever you are in the world you will be learning the biology and the ecology of marine animals or, mar- or marine plants and that is the same as what happens here it's just with warmer water so it's the same principle so it's, it's the best place to start best place to start <laughs> yeah Amazing. more cold <laughs> more, more cold um and i i think uh we've got maybe um a couple more questions because we've just come through mm-hmm. um one of one of them is looking at the um, impact of trinkets of of you know the tourism trinkets and and, and that 
impact on the reef. Is is that still going on in Bermuda or in other parts of the world, or or have we, are we moving beyond sort of looking at yeah. nature trinkets as, as something that's a, a, a good souvenir? Yeah, thankfully, in a, in a lot of places now, the education is there that people understand that it's bad to take trinkets from uh, the reef and from any marine environments, uh, especially. Um, especially corals, I mean, they grow so slowly. This, as I said, this is still a baby, but this, this could well have taken 20, 10, 15, 10 years, 15 years to get here, it depends on, on the other side, but it's, they, they grow slowly. And so just taking a little coral off the reef is obviously bad, just for a little bit of that. But I also think that um, corals now are, are protected. So CITES have done uh, okay. an excellent job at and protecting. CITES International, treaty or an organization yes. to protect endangered life. Endangered species, yeah, and endangered life, that's right. And I think, and corals are listed now in the CITES, so it's harder, it's definitely harder. But if so, but if you go to the shops here in Bermuda, you can still see some little corals for sale, but they're not Bermuda corals, because that's not allowed. So there's still pockets of the world now which are allowing um, still the trade in corals. And and, um, and the, other arts, uh, the other point is fisheries, and I think that uh, coral, trade fisheries or live fish trade if it's done correctly it could be it's okay and it can be a good income but unfortunately a lot of the time those fisheries are not run correctly and there's overfishing and there's bad fishing practices so you've just got to again it's just like it's just like when you go to the grocery store you've got to know your source <laughs> yes. and you've got to know whether it's sustainable so grow to love your own backyard your own your nearest ocean mm -hmm. and then come come watch sort of underwater photography or, or you know chasing coral the blue planet those types of programs right um but don't try and understand the reef by by picking up sort of absolutely <laughs> bits and pieces <laughs> bits and pieces leave them on the shoreline, leave them, leave them on the shoreline. <laughs> yeah well thank you so so much uh for sharing your experience and and um, your knowledge amazing knowledge about about the reef mm -hmm. um and as part of coral live it's been wonderful to have you so thank you very very thank much thank you everybody for tuning in that's been fun